talking about a wide span. A, a lot of stuff happens in this Parsha, doesn't it? I mean, uh, we have uh, the bride and, and going off, and uh, there's a lot. But we've talked about the, uh, the bride in the past. We've talked about uh, Abraham and, and uh, sending him off and the negotiations that follow and all the things that happen. We've talked about all those before, so I'm not really going to go back and talk about those here because uh, we've, we've done that. There's something else I, I feel we need to bring out for this time that we're in right now. But uh, let's start off with this. We have Chaye Sarah, not Ke Sarah. Okay, in case any of you are wondering, you know, that's a completely different thing, you know. But Chaye Sarah is the life of Sarah. But it starts off with, and she died. But it's the life of Sarah. So why are we starting off with death? Because... Here's the thing. We're not just talking about, okay, so she died, now what? We're talking about the legacy that she's leaving behind. We're talking about the things and how she dealt with her household and how she raised her, her son and how these things happened. These are the things we're looking at. This is the testimony that she left behind that we're paying attention to. So this is the legacy of what will follow. And what was the legacy that will follow? Well, if we think about this, where, where was Abraham and Yitzhak right before we find out that Sarah passed? They had a test, didn't they? Matter of fact, tradition says that's why Sarah died, is because she thought that Abraham took uh, Yitzhak out and killed him. <laughs> and it killed her. <laughs> so this is, this is one thing, because we're not really told why she died, other than the fact that she was 127 when she did. Okay, so there's a lot that we can say about it, but it's all speculation. So we have to learn in the testing that was given here, would Abraham be obedient to Yahweh no matter what the circumstances? And we saw that he, he did. Would Yitzhak be obedient to his father even though he may not understand completely what's happening? And we saw that he did. Would they both be obedient even to the laying down of their own lives? We saw that they were. Sarah raised a son who was obedient to his father's instruction no matter what. So, uh, again, tradition says that Sarah died upon hearing what was to happen to Yitzhak. But we know that because of what happened to Yitzhak, it was a shadow of what the Messiah is going to do for you, right? Philippians 1.21 says, For me, life is the Messiah and death is gain. To live is the Messiah and death is gain. So Sarah, even though she did not get to see the actual physical land of the promise that the Father was telling them about this whole time, she still got to enter into the promise. Okay, so, so it's just a, a different time. One of the things we need to learn in this Parsha, and uh, we talk about the negotiations for the, for the field of Machpelah, about uh, uh, the, the, the negotiation that happened there, and let's face it, guys, Abraham got ripped off. He didn't really try to negotiate with the people. He just said, name your price, I'll pay it. And uh, so, but again, we're not really going down that road, but the reason why he didn't care to pay an exorbitant amount for what he didn't, shouldn't have had to was he was trying to honor his wife and his family. So Hebrews 11 tells us examples of faith, of the people of faith that have gone before. And so we need to use them as examples. I mean, the, the Scripture gives us examples of people of great faith to encourage us and to warn us. See, to encourage us when we see these great and mighty things that happen, but to warn us when we see where they led astray and things didn't work out so well for them. Can you imagine if your whole life was written down for the entire world to see? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. So therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, what this is saying is, be careful of, of how you approach these things, because when we think we got it all together, that's when something's going to come and knock you down. We need to learn that our very next breath, our very next step, and everything that we do is nothing but by the grace of Yah. Okay. So we have this narration in the, that where Yitzhak now reappears in the story. And I find it interesting that we didn't see or hear anything about him from the time he was on the mountain, from the time he was at Moriah. Now all of a sudden, he comes back into the story to claim his bride. And again, I think this is a picture of the Messiah. Now we see he's returning to receive his bride. 
Okay, but again, we've done that. We've talked about that before. That's not where I want to focus the emphasis on this. Genesis 24:62 says, "So Yitzhak had returned from Be'er Lachai Roy and was dwelling in the Negev." So it does not say he was living near Be'er Lachai Be'er Lachai Roy. It says he was living in the Negev. So he was visiting that well. Why would he be visiting that well? Again, speculation, but there is a, a pretty neat fact that's given there. The term, Be'er Lachai Roy, is the well of the living one, my seer. Who named it? Hagar. Hagar named that well when she, the first time she was sent away, when she was pregnant, and it was kind of shove it in Sarah's face, saying, see, I'm pregnant, na 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 and so she's like, I can't take it. Send her away, right? And so she was crying out to God, and God said, go back and submit yourself to Sarah. And so he said that, that you will have a son, he will be called Ishmael, and he will be a great nation. But the, but the promise is going to be through Yitzhak, okay? So Isaac could have been there just praying to the one who sees you know, in, in, the, in the times back here in the ancient Near East, the, the, the specific places had meaning. And so they would, go to this, they would go to this place to pray, to meditate, to think. You know, think about what happened here in this place. God saw, God heard, and God answered. So maybe he just went to go visit, because what was he upset about? We read in the story, he was upset because his mother had passed. And he was, let's just, put it, let's just paraphrase it and put it this way, he was inconsolable. And so he was, he was at, at, at war with himself. And so I believe he was seeking peace with the Father. And so he went to go see, God, are you hearing? God, are you seeing? God, are, are you getting all this? And so that's where he was. And then he comes back. And uh, again, one of the reasons why we say this, Isaac returned from Be'er, Be'er Lachai Roy, and he was dwelling in the Negev. In Genesis 25, 11, we read, After the death of Abraham, God blessed Yitzhak's son, and Isaac settled at... Be'er Lahai Roy. So there's a couple different times that he goes there, and a couple different times this is mentioned. Then, and so even after Abraham died, he, he moved back to this area right here. Maybe, all speculation, just saying, maybe he went here, he prayed, and when he went back home in the Negev, he was out in the field, which I don't know <laughs> in, the, in the Negev how many fields you can get because it's pretty dry out there. But in the Negev, here he is, he, and he's out in the field, and he's still meditating and praying. And then God, I believe, answered his prayer. So maybe he went back to this place because it had a special meaning for him, because yes, God truly does see. Okay? So we continue in that, Genesis 24, 62 and 63. So Yitzhak returned from Er Laharoi and was dwelling in the Negev, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. Okay. So with this, I want to talk about times of prayer. I want to talk about how the scripture, in the scripture we find different times that people prayed. Now, it doesn't say at this time you are supposed to pray, but again, is there anything wrong with praying? No. Is there anything wrong with stopping throughout the day to pray? No. And is there anything wrong with getting other people to pray with you? Did you do that? No. It, says, it wasn't a commandment to do so, but there's nothing wrong with doing it. Okay? So what times of prayer were instituted in the Scripture, and by whom, and uh, are they still seen today? Yeah. And they are, it is. So let's talk a little bit about that. Psalm 55, 16 and 17 says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening, morning, and noon will I pray, and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. When did he say he will pray? Evening, morning, and noon. So that's pretty much all day, isn't it? You know where we have that scripture where it says pray without ceasing? You know, that doesn't mean that pray and never stop. That means when you, you can't talk to anybody, you can't have a conversation with anybody else because you're praying. You can't do your job because you're praying. That's not what it means, does it? No. No. It means that throughout the day, you are making connections to the Father. Throughout the day, you are stopping and praying, even just short little prayers. So throughout the day, you are making connections and you are praying. That's what it means. 
that we're ever mindful of, of the Father and what he's doing for us and, and working with us, right? Do we see him as our everything? Because if we see Yahweh as our everything, we will seek him first when things happen. Why is it that when something happens, we typically don't seek the Father first? We typically seek a neighbor or call someone up to complain or a friend? When we have a problem, do we immediately go, go run to check the bank account? And after we've complained and done everything else, then we'll try praying. Is that the way we're supposed to do it? No. Why isn't prayer the first thing we do? Because do we, do we believe that prayer works? Do we believe that prayer is something that the Father gave to us to help develop relationship? Then we need to, then we need to pray. We need to go to the source. Job 28.20 says, Where does wisdom come from? Where is the source of understanding? Psalm 87.7, Singers and dancers alike say, For me, you are the source of of everything. Jeremiah 17, 13, hope of Israel, Adonai, all who abandon you will be ashamed. Those who leave you will be inscribed in the dust because they have abandoned Adonai, the source of living water. Is he the source of our everything? And if he is, then we need to acknowledge him in all things. And we need to turn to him in all things. Romans 15, 5, and may God the source of encouragement and patience. How many of us need that? Encouragement and patience. Yes. It says, may God, the source of encouragement and patience, give you the same attitude. The same what? Attitude. Boy, we got enough attitude, don't we? <laughs> Wrong kind. <laughs> it says, may, the God, may God, who is the source of encouragement and patience, give you all the same attitude that the Messiah had. In other words, our outlook on life and the things and how we treat each other, all these things should be a reflection of, of what the Messiah did when he was here. Verse 6, so that with one accord and with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. How do we in one accord with one voice? That's prayer, guys. That's prayer, that's praise, that's worship. This is all these things that are happening together. Romans 15, 13. May God, the source of hope, fill you completely with joy and shalom as you continue trusting, so that by the power of the Ruach HaKadosh, you may overflow with hope. Romans 16, 20. The God, uh, the source of shalom, will soon crush the adversary under your feet, and the grace of our Lord Yeshua be with you. Hebrews 5, 9. After he had been brought to the goal, he became the source of eternal deliverance to all who obey him. He is the source of everything. What does it mean for something to be the source that's where something originates. And so if we understand that everything we have originates with him, then we will seek him in all things. Right? I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Let me ask you a question. Those that seek me early shall find me. Does this mean that anybody who gets up after 5 a.m. will not find him? That's not really what it means, is it? It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get up before, sun, before sunrise to do that. What he's saying is those that seek me early shall find me. Um, it doesn't say those that seek me in the morning shall find me. So the rest of the day, forget about it. How we look at this is if we seek him early in a situation, do we seek him first or do we seek him after we've done everything else? We've tried everything else. We've tried to do it our way. God, I tried to handle it the best that I could. And I just made it worse. So I guess I'll have to pray and wait. See what I mean? Are we seeking him early? Are we seeking him first in a situation? Let's look at this. The Father desires to be with you. He loves you. He, he wants you to have fellowship with him. So he desires that relationship with you, and he will reveal himself to you through prayer, through his word, and through his people. All of these things working together for your good. Because the Father loves you. Now think about this for a second. Because he loves you, you can pray to him anytime. Because he loves you, you can, you can look at his word and, and, and have something there of life for you. And because he loves you, he put your brothers and sisters in your life to help you. If you like it or not. Think about that. Because we are 
here to help one another, aren't we? The fact is this. The Father wants to hear our prayer. Matter of fact, he's waiting to hear us. Yes, the scripture says that he knows what you need before you ask, but that doesn't mean that you don't ask. It means he desires you to acknowledge that you desire it from him. He wants relationship with us. Because here's the thing. If we feel like prayer doesn't make a difference, or if we think that he's not listening, then we're really but a lie. Because prayer does make a difference. Isaiah 65, 23. They will not toil in vain or raise children to be destroyed, for they are the seed blessed by Adonai and their offspring with them. Before they call, I will answer. Guys, how many times have you, have you had a situation where you've said, okay, I, I, I'm praying because I, I need some guidance or I need something, and you're praying, and then you see the answer to it and realize that the answer to your prayer was on its way to you before you even prayed. This is what he's talking about. So, so before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. It doesn't matter saying, you know, you're not going to get God's voicemail. <laughs> you can pray any time. He's there for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Always be joyful. Pray without ceasing. What that means is pray regularly. Okay, make a habit of praying regularly. In everything, give thanks. For this is what God wants from you who are united with the Messiah Yeshua. Do not quench the Spirit. Luke 6, 28 says, Bless those who curse you and what? Pray for those who mistreat you. How hard is it to pray for someone when they're really working you over? <laughs> How hard is it to pray for someone when they're saying things to you that are just mean or, or it's not true even? Or how about when you know that they really don't care about you, they're just using you because they want you to do something for them? What did Yeshua say? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for them. Because the thing is, it's not about them. It's about as you bless them, that allows blessing in your life. Right? It's not a matter of uh, saying you love somebody who loves you. It's easy. Everyone can do that. But can you love someone even when they're not being lovable? Let's not talk about marriage now, huh? Ladies, you look over at your husband, you're like, do I have to? <laughs> yeah? How, how hard is it to love and to show love if you really desire that? In order to pray for one another, here's the thing, we have to learn to be at shalom with one another. In order to pray for one another, we have to have that peace with one another. We have to dwell with each other in shalom. We have to really want what the Father wants for each other. We want the good things. We want the desire to bless us. We want him to, uh, to make us echad, to make us one with him and one with each other. But if we're, if we're not willing to do that, then it will hinder our prayers. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Matthew 5.22, I tell you, anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment. Whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought before the Sanhedrin, and whoever says fool incurs the penalty of burning in the fire of Gehenna. So if you are offering your gift at the temple altar, and you remember there that your brother has something against you, leave your gift where it is by the altar and go make peace with your brother, then come back and offer your gift. He's saying, now this was, a, this was worship, guys, to offer a gift at the offering uh, at, the, at the altar, this was a mode of worship. So if he's saying, if you're coming and you're worshiping and you know that there's resentment there, fix that. If there's a problem there, fix that. And then he didn't say, he didn't say, so don't bring your offering until it happens, because see, then we can read in that, that that could let years go by. No, he's telling you, go fix it, then come back and bring your, bring your offering. Matter of fact, leave it right here. So, we, so think about that for a minute. By saying, leave it there, implies you better hurry up and get back to it, right? In other words, don't let things take a long time. Make it right. Do not let offenses hinder you from the presence of Yahweh, because it will. And offenses is one of the biggest things the adversary has in these times that we're in. 
If he can get people upset and offended with one another to where they're not talking to each other or not desiring the best for each other or not wanting to be a chad with each other, can we really have the unity of the spirit, heart, and mind and to dwell in the presence of Yah and show his love to the people around us if we're walking around offended all the time? No. Why do you think everyone's offended all the time? Yeah, I, th- I, think, I think, like in America, this drastic spirit of offense just fell all, all over America. And everybody's offended about everything. We can't speak the truth because that's now considered hate speech. Really? Matthew 6.14 says, If you forgive others their offenses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their offenses, your Heavenly Father will not forgive yours. We cannot go to Yahweh and say, I have sinned, forgive me, if we are not willing to pardon the brothers who have sinned against us. Hmm. 1 Peter 3.7 Husbands! Who's it speaking to? Husbands. Conduct your married lives with understanding. Although your wife may be the weaker physically, you should respect her as a fellow heir of the gift of life. If you don't, your prayers will be blocked. Guys, if you are mistreating or mishandling or, or whatever with your wife, your prayers aren't getting heard. Talk about the severity. Talk, see, we don't understand covenant anymore. And see, you, uh, husbands, I'm talking to you guys, you are supposed to be a model and a picture of the Messiah and his bride, the, tr- the, 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 the assemblies, the body. And he laid his life down for her. We should do the same. James 5.16, Confess therefore your offenses one to another and pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. We're talking about healing. We're talking about restoration. So we're talking about uh, uh, praying and working with one another. But we have to acknowledge where where we're off. Because we have to be willing to be able to say where we've missed it. Right? So that you may be healed. The fervent supplication of a righteous man has much power. So back to prayer. Abraham, it's considered that Abraham introduced the morning prayers. Isaac introduced the afternoon prayers. And Jacob, the evening prayers. Because this is how we see it identified in the Scripture. Okay, Genesis 19.27, when Abraham uh, went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Now, it says the place where he stood before the Lord is El Hamakom, Asher Ahmad. And Ahmad is to stand, but we also know that Ahmad is, is also signifies prayer. So to stand and to pray is not a foreign concept to the Jewish people or among Israel. Right? Matter of fact, you get a group of guys together, what are they doing? They're standing together in a group and they're praying. Now that's not to say that there aren't times when you can pray on your knees or can pray with your, with your face to the ground. We find examples of all of this in the scripture. But this is the, what we're talking about with Abraham. Okay, and Here's another example. Psalm 106.30 says, Pinchas stood up and he intervened and the plague was stayed. That word for intervene is the word palal which means to judge, which also means to intercede, also means to pray. Lahit palel is another word for prayer. So again, to intervene, to intercede, what Pinchas did was an act of intercession. And when you look at it, you, you really get a different uh, mindset of what actually happened there. The afternoon prayers. Isaac prayed in the afternoon because Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards the evening. The word uh, for meditate right here is lasuach. It's this word, siach. Hey, Alan, that's just siach, right? <laughs> the word siach means contemplation, utterance, complaint, but also means meditation, prayer, and talk. So this meditation means prayer. And it says towards evening. Now, it doesn't say in the evening. It says towards evening, which means afternoon. Okay, the evening hasn't happened yet. It was going toward the evening. All right, so this time of meditation, it was in the, in the afternoon. And again, the reason why we say that this word right here, lasuach, meditate, also means prayer, is we also see in Psalm 102.1, a prayer of the afflicted when he faints and pours out his meditation before the Lord. Again, meditation can be uh, an utterance, a complaint, meditation, prayer, or even just talking. So again, Yitzhak... He was out meditating, and he was out in the field to there. 
So, the Mincha prayers are composed of a few different things. The Mincha prayers are the after, or what we call the afternoon prayers. All right? It's composed of Psalm 145. It's composed of the Amidah. And then a prayer of repentance. And then what's called the Elenu. All right? The Mincha is often the most forgotten prayer service that there is. People pray in the morning, they pray in the evening, but during the day, it's, it's inconvenient for people to stop and pray while you're working their job or while they're doing things or whatever. You know, it was really neat when we were in Israel. Come 3 o'clock, no matter where we were, no matter what we were doing, no matter who was around, we stopped, we faced Jerusalem, and we said the Shema. You know what's really neat? You're standing around with, with a, a whole bunch of people who are not pro-Israel, <laughs> And you're standing there saying the Shema in the midst of them. Wow. It says it does something. It really does. When you stop what you're doing to turn your focus back to the Father. This is an example we get from the Mincha prayers that are given here. Psalm 145, we read this. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Of the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous ways I will meditate. Can you imagine if just stopping in the middle of the day and just kind of reading this? That's kind of energizing, isn't it? It's good stuff. Let's keep reading. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in, stead, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is, is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him and all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears the cry and saves them. The Lord pres preserves all who loves him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Good stuff, huh? And then in the Mincha prayers, they do the Amidah. Now what's interesting is there is a shortened version of the Amidah that you can find in the Brit Hadashah. Here's one place where we see it, Luke 11, 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day the food that we need. Forgive us our sins as we too forgive everyone who has wronged us and not lead us to hard testing. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Realize that the, the, what, we, what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer is actually a version of the Amidah. Think about that for a second. That everything that he's saying in there, we can find in the Amidah. Hmm. Which was written, it's attributed to Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly. Ezra and Nehemiah and the men of the Great Assembly. And I think it was around 4 BCE, somewhere in that. So then there's a prayer of repentance. And then there is Alenu. Alenu reads this. It is our duty to praise the master of all to acclaim the greatness of the one who forms all creation. For God did not make us like the nations of other lands and did not make us the same as other families of the earth. God did not place us in the same situations as others, and our destiny is not the same as anyone else's. And we bend our knees and bow down and give thanks before the ruler, the ruler of rulers, the Holy One, blessed is God. The one who spread out the heavens and made the foundations of the earth and whose precious dwelling is in the heavens above and whose powerful presence is in the highest heights. Adonai is our God, there is none else. Our God is truth and nothing else compares. As it is written in your Torah, and you shall know today and take it to heart that Adonai is the only God in the heaven above and on earth below there is no other. Therefore we put our hope in you, Adonai our God, to soon see the glory of your strength 
to remove all idols from the earth, and to completely cut off all false gods, to repair the world, your holy empire, and for all living flesh to call your name, and for all the wicked of the earth to turn to you. May all the world's inhabitants recognize and know that, you, to, that to you every knee must bend and every tongue must swear loyalty. Before you, Adonai, our God, may all bow down and give honor to your precious name, and may all take upon themselves the yoke of your rule. Do some of these sound familiar? We, we, we have scripture that lines up with this, don't we? And may you reign over them soon and forever and always, because all rule is yours alone, and you will rule in honor forever and ever. As it is written in your Torah, Adonai will reign forever and ever. And it is said, Adonai will be ruler over the whole earth. And on that day, God will be one, and his name will be one. Amen. Then, that's the Mincha prayers. Then we have an evening prayer. So it's attributed to Jacob instituting the evening prayer, but it's not really... Jacob that instituted it, okay? Because the way a scripture reads is, well, let's look at it. Genesis 28, 11. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. So it's like the way this literally kind of reads is, and he happened upon a place. And he's, or he stumbled upon a place. And there he met with the father and he had a conversation with him. Okay, so his, and he had a dream, and, and he prayed. And so all these things happen. But this is the word that's called, and he encountered, right? It's right here. Vayifga. Vayifga is the word for encountered. So pagia relates to prayer or intercession. Also, we read in Jeremiah 7.16, where it's talking about making intercession. It's the word tifga. It's the same word that's used there. So he says, so he, he came to a certain place. We can also say that he encountered a certain place, or there he prayed and made intercession. So who actually instituted that? I believe the father did. But he had a, he had a, had a role to play in it, didn't he? Evening, just as a side note, evening is also a mixture. The word is arav, or erev, which is, yeah, that's where we get the word Arab from. And the word Erev, it means evening, and it's the, the idea of Erev is where the darkness and the light start to mix. And so the sun is going down and the evening is coming on. So in the Mishkan, when they were having the, the service in the tabernacle, there was prayer and there was worship going on at the same time. Think about this. They were mixing their prayer and their worship. At the same time, they were coming, they were bringing their offerings. Again, this was a mode of worship. They were worshiping. And so there would be prayers and there would be singing and there would be all these things that were happening at the same time while they were bringing these offerings to Yahweh. So the evening service is Ma'ariv, and what would happen is the afternoon tamid, remember there was a, a, one offering that was put on in the morning, the first thing behind anything else, they cleared out the ashes and they put an offering on the, on the morning before anyone could bring theirs. This one had to go on first. And then at the end of the evening, there was one that was put on. It's the tamid, it's the continual offering, and it stayed on there all night, completely burnt down, reduced to ash for the next morning. Okay? And the job of, of, of the priest that was there was to make sure that the fire did not go out and that that offering did stay there and was completely consumed by morning. As they're doing these things, the Shema and the Amidah would be said again. So, uh, so as they were all these offerings, all these things that were happening, you know, we think that the temple was just some extremely solemn place, but can you imagine with all these people singing and, all the, and, and a lot of the Levites were musicians, and so all these, the, the singing and the songs and the praise and the worship, all these things happening, I don't think it would have been a, just a real quiet place, do you? Yeah. And I wonder how far in the midst of the camp they could hear that. I wonder if the entire camp could hear it, or if you had to actually get close to it, you know, when you start to go in. Just food for thought. Psalm 134 says, A song of ascent, Shir HaMa'alot, Come bless Adonai, all you servants of Adonai, who serve each night in the house of Adonai. Who are the ones that are serving at night? The priests, who are making sure that the offering, they're, they're tending the altar, guys. They're tending the altar to make sure that, that, that the fire is lit and it's not going to go out, all right? But we read in the Hebrew this word, ha-omdim, this is the word amad. What does amad mean? Stand. 
And so we, it, we translate it as those who serve, but literally it means those who stand all night in the house of the Lord. So what are they doing while they're standing? They're praying. And it says, lift your hands toward the sanctuary and bless Adonai. And may Adonai, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Sion. This is one of the reasons why, it's almost like this, is why people turn toward Jerusalem to pray. Turn toward the sanctuary, the place where he put his name. Because the holy place, we turn and face, face that. Daniel 6.10 when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. Okay, so we see he knelt down and he was in his upstairs room and he did this three times a day. He prayed toward Jerusalem. Can you imagine? The only thing they could find wrong with him is, well, he prays a lot. <laughs> so they had to come up with some crazy law to get him on that. But why would he pray three times a day? Because this is the times that people prayed. This was the times that they stopped everything they were doing so that they could pray. These are the times that the offerings were brought, so they prayed at the times these offerings were brought. So think about that for a minute. As you as a worshiper came, you brought your offering, and, and understand that here I am, although I'm here in the Mishkan, or even the temple at the time when it stood, I'm here in that, and I'm bringing an offering here, and there's songs, and there's praises, and all these things that are going on, but it's also happening in the homes, and it's also happening in the synagogues, and it's also happening throughout all Jerusalem. So even if someone's not literally there, they're still part of it. The Old Testament times of prayer were in the New Testament. <laughs> That'll make some people's heads spin, won't it? <laughs> Here's something else for you. We find record where the disciples prayed during the instituted times of prayer. There's nothing wrong with it, guys. Here's a couple. Acts 2.15. We know Acts chapter 2, right? Shavuot, right? But he makes a point of saying the people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Why would he make a point of saying it's only nine in the morning? Why were they there? Yes, it was Shavuot, but what were they doing? They were praying. We read in the scripture, it says, so they were all in, all in one accord and in one place. Where were they? Guys, you can't fit 3,000 people in an upper room. They were in the temple, in the courtyards. They were there. And so... Here they are at the times of the morning prayer when the Father poured himself out. Acts 3.1. So one afternoon at 3 o'clock, Peter and John were going to the temple. Why would Peter and John be going to the temple at 3 o'clock? Because that was the time of the afternoon prayers. They were going to join with their brothers in prayer. Acts 10, Cornelius, read this. He was a devout man, a God-fearer, as was his whole household, and he gave generously to help the Jewish poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, why make a mention of about the time? Why bother? I mean, but then it says, so he prayed regularly, and then one afternoon, about 3, why make the point? Because it was the time of the afternoon prayers. Even though he was at home, he was still praying while the while prayers are being said in the temple. So he was again joining himself with the people of Yad. So there, they saw clearly a vision of the angel and, he, and, and the, it spoke to him. So when the temple was destroyed, the prayer services continued. Now think about that for a second. They destroy the temple and destroy the altar. They couldn't bring the offerings. They couldn't bring those, those anymore. But what's going to stop them from praying? Does it mean now because the, that we, they can't bring their offerings anymore that they, that they don't pray at all? Because, well, we can't do that, so we're not going to do anything. No. Though that's gone and we can't do that, what's going to stop us from prayer? And that's why it's still instituted today, why you see people praying three times a day. And some of the things that are said when they pray is the Shema and the Amidah. The Shema has three passages. Okay, it's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21, and Numbers 15, 37 to 41. The focus of them is this, that Yahweh is God alone. We serve him his way, and we will teach it to our children. That's just to shorten it. 
Matthew 6, 5 says this. So when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people can see them. I'll tell you they have their reward already. I want to make a point that, that you understand. Yeshua is not against public prayer. And, not, and what he's saying here is not saying don't pray in public. Because we've heard it said, so when you pray, you go in your, your prayer closet, right? But if you keep, keep the rest of that passage in context, he was talking about pride. And so what he's saying is the people that are standing out here doing this publicly to be seen, yeah, they get their accolades of men and that's all they're going to get. But he didn't say don't pray in public. Because then that would take away, again, like the prayer in the temple and prayer in the synagogues and, and all these things, it would, t- it would remove all of that. So it's not what he was talking about. Matter of fact, we see areas where corporate prayer was encouraged. Look at this, Matthew 6. So you therefore pray like this. Again, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Look at, look at this for a second. Our Father in heaven. Okay, first off, what was that first word? Our. Is that singular or plural? Plural. So is that meant to be said for one person, or is that meant to be said in a community of people? Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give who? Us. The food we need today. Forgive who? Us. As we have forgiven those who wronged us. Yeshua is is not saying don't pray. He's not saying don't pray together. Don't pray corporately. Don't pray in public. What he's saying is don't do things out of pride. And matter of fact, there needs to be a time of coming together and yes, you can pray in yourself and, and, and by yourself and at home and in your prayer closet. Go do that. You need to. But there's times to come together and to pray too. Again, do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil, evil one for kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Again, this relates to the Amidah, the prayers that are, that are given in the Amidah. The Amidah tradition says it was composed by Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly. It's a compilation of prayers, also called the Shemone Esre, which is 18 different prayers. And uh, how would you write 18 in, in Hebrew? Het, Yod, which is a word. What is it? Life. So these prayers cover just about every aspect of life. As you're praying through them, you can see your daily life unfolding in the midst of them our focus throughout our life it helps bring us back into focus for the father and to show us what he desires for us the prayers allow us to come together in unity they allow us to pray with one voice and they allow us to agree together that way we're all praying for the same thing we we how many times do we hear so we're all in one accord and all in one one mind one heart if we're praying for the same thing that's great but how do we know if we're praying for the same thing? Let's pray his word. And this is just one of the areas that we can do that. Is the Amidah for, let's say, okay, but I believe Yeshua is the Messiah, so is the Amidah for me? Well, yeah. Think about this for a second. First off, like we already said, you know, the Lord's Prayer is a shortened version of it. But beyond that, it's the prayer of the daily times of sacrifice. So that during the sacrifices, when the sacrifices were being made, this was one of the prayers that would be offered, right? So we're talking about in the morning, the afternoon, and in the evening, right? Which also means it was being prayed during the crucifixion. It was been prayed at his death. And it would have been prayed at his resurrection. I don't know, is it for you? Yeah, absolutely. The Father trying to tell us that He is our everything? Yes. Everything that He has laid out for us, developed every part of our life that belongs to Him? Yes. Is prayer important? Yes. Let's, let's let our hearts be knit with His heart and learn to walk in His ways and to do it His way. Don't, not forsaking the assembling together, but yet gathering together and looking out for each other. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand.